striped marlins hunting a school of sardines. A marlin, three meters long, is powerful, deadly, and among the fastest of fish. Until these sequences were filmed, it was not known that marlins hunt together. Like a pack of wolves stalking a herd of deer, they cooperate in pursuit of their prey. They will follow an escaping school into the deep, then drive it upwards against the surface. That marlins hunt in packs is one of many secrets revealed by Howard Hall and his cameras in the sea. Howard's quest to present life stories of marine animals on film began among creatures he knew first. I first learned to dive in the giant kelp forests off my home state of California. Soon the marine life there became subjects for my cameras and I wanted to tell the stories of their lives reveal what they actually did. This is one of my favorite animals. It's a Garibaldi. It's a male, and he's removing a sea urchin from his nest. Among Garibaldis, the male does all the domestic chores. We spent two weeks filming this animal, watching him every day, watching what he does. The male builds his nest by removing all the algae on the rocks and just leaves one species of red algae. And then he begins a courtship display in hopes of attracting a female. He can tell a female is interested because she erects a dorsal fin on her back. He attracts her by making a clucking sound. If his display is successful, the female will enter the nest and begin laying eggs. When she's finished, she'll begin eating the eggs so the male will have to chase her off. It takes about two weeks for the tiny eggs to hatch. During that time, the male will guard the nest and make sure no predators will come in and take the eggs. We use lights when we're filming underwater, not to light things up, but to bring out the colors that are already there. Without the lights, the images are very monochromatic. We just put lights on to bring the colors out. Tripod, lights, and camera. It's a film set in the sea. Michelle Hall met Howard when he was her diving instructor. Now she's not only his wife, but one of the team of diving photographers Howard relies on to assist with equipment he adapts or designs. So what is it like to go to work underwater? Each dive is an adventure. It's challenging, both mentally and physically, but the rewards are worth it. It's a different world down there. 
Sometimes you find animals that people have never seen before, capture behaviors that nobody's ever witnessed. And there are dangers down there, but the team relies on each other for safety. The animals behave differently underwater. Some animals that would be afraid of you on land are incredibly friendly underwater. You have to know your animal by day and by night. Our team relies on each other for safety, and that's our most important concern. Our mission is to capture stories on film. It's not air, but the dissolved gases and minerals in seawater that nourish the blizzard of tiny creatures of the plankton, microscopic plants and animals. These are shrimps adrift on the currents. From creatures as small as these to a passing whale, a chain of life extends through the sea, each animal food for another in that chain. Coral polyps passively capture passers-by. This blenny has to dart from hiding for a meal of these mycid shrimps. This tiny fish, with its, to our eyes, rather humorous antics for survival, can be as much of a character in a Howard Hall film as the largest of whales. But how do you find a blue whale in the ocean? The trick to filming blue whales underwater is to first find what they eat, krill. Once you find a swarm of krill, what you do is simply lie in it and wait for the whales to come to you. Blue whale can be almost 100 feet long. Seeing something like that underwater is an experience that's absolutely incredible. A lot of people think that capturing these images is pure luck. Uh, certainly a lot of luck is involved, but we also increase our opportunities by spending enormous amounts of time underwater and by knowing our subject material. Five tons of krill, thumb-sized shrimps, may be scooped into the gigantic mouth in only a day. The throat billows out, filled by the influx of water from which the krill will be filtered. This mouth is so large that another kind of filter-feeding whale, the grey whale, could fit inside. A blue whale's body, some 30 meters long, can weigh more than 24 African bull elephants. Grey whales may well be much smaller than this huge blue, but they can be just as intriguing. Howard encountered one off the Californian coast migrating north. The incredible thing about filming this grey whale was that scientists have always believed that they don't feed during their migrations. But we actually filmed them feeding off the coast of California. As far as I know, that's never been done before. It might almost seem as if the whale's showing off for the camera. Certainly these animals are extremely intelligent and very curious. He was curious about me like he'd be curious about a sea lion or a dolphin or some other animal that he found interesting underwater. I know that this animal is really following me. It swims much faster than I can swim, and if it wasn't following me, it would simply be gone. It would just swim away, feeding, and I couldn't possibly follow. One of the ways that I am able to capture these images is by getting a feel for what the animal's thinking, sort of predicting his mood, and I think that that's really important. Once you understand what an animal is going to do, then you can be in the right place at the right time. 
The grey whale has fed on the shrimps and clams it scraped from the muddy sea bed. Now it heads up for a breath of air and to continue its northward journey. Far from these Californian waters across the globe, the team encounters a different whale off Patagonia. The southern right whale is much larger than the gray whale. It was huge, tremendously large in girth. There's no way we could get anywhere near this animal if it didn't want us around. It literally followed us around underwater. Those white callosities on its nose, the old whalers called its bonnet. They're really overgrown hair follicles that become infested with several kinds of crab and shrimp. The callosities' purpose, if any, is unknown. A right whale is a krill feeder, straining the food from the sea through combs of whalebone or baleen in its mouth. Of course, the whale would have to go up and breathe now and again, and we would swim away. The way we'd get many of these shots is simply to swim away from the animal, swim as fast as we can, trying to get as far away as possible, because the whale would turn and follow us. It actually followed us for nearly four or five hours. Eventually, he'll lose interest and go away. Another expedition, another sea. Howard seeks more than impressive images and the sensationalism of taking audiences where they may never go. He films the stories behind the pictures, wanting to show what happens, rather than leave it all to the narrator. Today, they're following a sperm whale and her calf. Sperm whales are the largest toothed predator on the planet, and you can't help but think about that when you start to get near one. This is a mother and a calf. The mother will feed more than a mile below the surface, hunting giant squid down in the depths. The baby's not equipped to make the dive. He'll have to wait till he's a little bit older before he can dive so deeply. So he'll stay on the surface and wait for the mother to return. She may be gone more than an hour. And during that time, he has nothing to do. So he just lays around on the surface, plays with whatever is at hand, which happens to be us, and waits. The baby takes a breath of air through its single blowhole offset to the left side of its snout. Then curiosity again seems to bond man and animal. While you're filming the baby sperm whale, you can't help but think of mom way down deep with those big teeth. And you know she's talking to the baby the whole time. So you don't want to upset that baby. Nearly half a sperm whale's body is its head. That's some nine meters when this youngster is fully grown. For about a year, this calf will be suckled by its mother. This one seems overloaded with remoras, sucker fish that attach to its skin and hitch a ride. In shallow waters around the Bahamas, Howard follows up on a story he's heard from some scientists familiar with the dolphins here. Some bottlenose dolphins have been seen to feed in a way unfamiliar to marine biologists. New observations are frequent in the world of ocean science. the dolphins are able to capture fish that actually live beneath the surface of the sand. They use sonar to find the fish. They can detect them even though they're buried. And once they detect them, they dig them up. They dig by squirting water straight down into the sand, and they form a deep hole and then find the fish. I never would have expected to see dolphins feeding in this way. It was really unusual. I didn't expect to get very close, too. 
but I was able to get within six or seven feet of the dolphins while they engaged in this behavior. Of course, the trick to getting close is to spend a lot of time trying. We spent days following these dolphins around and eventually they became accustomed to us. They just carried on as if we weren't there. Howard's film confirms that these bottlenose dolphins did indeed feed regularly like this. The scientific study of their technique continues. Another secret of the sea had been revealed. One way for our knowledge of life in the sea to advance is by direct observation. But this is costly in time at sea and specialized equipment, though in Howard's opinion, not as expensive as our explorations of outer space. To Howard, the pursuit of new understanding of animals and plants throughout the oceans that cover two thirds of our planet is even more vital than any journey to the stars. Divers and astronauts do have a lot in common. Both require protective clothing and a means of carrying our planet's atmosphere with them. And they work as a team. Tripods, lights and cameras are taken to the sea floor by camera assistants. Everything must be in working order and ready to go. They will be underwater for some hours and must be prepared for whatever happens. I greatly admire the techniques some cameramen use for filming in aquariums. But for me, filming these behaviors underwater in the ocean is actually easier. The scorpion fish is an ambush predator. He'll attack anything that swims by. He's armed with poisonous spines on his pectoral and dorsal fins. The octopus is also well camouflaged, but when he moves, he becomes pretty obvious. Even a scorpion fish will sometimes bite off more than he can chew. The strategies that animals use underwater are just like the strategies animals use on the plains of Africa, things like camouflage and ambush. The angel shark has rejected this capture. Shaken but little stirred, this young hero is well armed. Sharp spines alongside the fins on its back are a baby horned shark's insurance against such ambush. Who eats whom in the sea is essential knowledge if the communities of the ocean are to be understood. Many of Howard Hall's stories reveal vital links between species and hold the often spectacular network of undersea life together.
Sea lions feed on the dense shoals of fish around California's shores is no surprise. But there are mysteries in the sea that Howard Hall cannot resist investigating. How is it, for example, that a shark can feed on small planktonic animals, far smaller than these sardines, and widely scattered on the currents? These are blue sharks. Normally they feed on squid and fish. But occasionally they've been found with huge amounts of krill in their stomach. How blue sharks could capture such tiny prey has long been a mystery, a mystery we were able to solve. It turns out that sardines can drive krill into extremely tight balls. The balls were so dense that the blue sharks were actually able to feed directly on the krill. When the krill are compacted so tightly, the blue sharks can go right through the ball, open their mouth, and grab large amounts of krill. It was great to capture this behavior on film. It was also a lot of fun to show the scientists how this actually worked. Such a discovery is more likely to be made by a diver like Howard Hall, who spends about a hundred days a year underwater, watching for such behavior. In some cases, a sedentary animal may appear to do very little, until the photographers use the technique of time-lapse filming, which gives the effect of speeding up the action. In just 30 seconds, the activity of four hours can be shown. Every 10 seconds, a single frame of film is exposed. It's a cold and tedious procedure. But shown at 25 frames per second, the effect produced is magical. Here is social interaction, as well as predation and aggression. The seafloor community is seen to be a very lively one. It just proceeds at a much slower pace than we can perceive normally. The starfish seem liberated from their leathery or hard straight jackets to become supple, agile and responsive to each other, even to the point of fighting. The advance of such armies into new territory becomes a dramatic march, usually imperceptible to our eyes. Other characters, such as this sarcastic fringe-head fish, are dramatic enough in normal time. Males frequently face up to each other in a battle for living space. On the side of the undersea mountain where they live, such territorial squabbles take place among various kinds of animal. Fringe-head fish are very possessive of territory and have a surprising way of bad-mouthing each other in order to hold their ground. Far off, in tropical waters, lives the whale shark, the largest fish in the ocean. Howard Hall and his team are concentrating on the story of the whale shark as a moving, living community, a kind of floating reef. Hundreds of other fishes travel with this giant, feeding around its mouth and gills. They find security close to so great a fish, and they gain a free ride. By hanging on to the shark's vast pectoral fin, Howard can film fishes held in the slipstream, close to the skin. Even the remoras are not attached, just riding effortlessly alongside the huge body. 
gigantic as it is, the whale shark is harmless to divers. This fish feeds on plankton. It travels the waters with its mouth open, trapping the microscopic plants and animals on its gills. Sixteen meters long, its great bulk pushes water ahead of it, a phenomenon that takes Howard Hall by surprise. I was concentrating so hard on the image I was looking at through the viewfinder that I didn't realize that I was captured by the pressure wave that the animal was pushing ahead of it. I was actually being driven backwards through the water and not even realizing it. I was also being driven straight down. The whale shark had turned and was heading straight toward the bottom. And without even knowing it, I was being pushed down really fast. I noticed a pressure change on my ears, but I didn't realize how deep we'd gotten until finally I took my eye from the camera and looked at my depth gauge. It was then that I noticed that we were nearly 200 feet down, much deeper than I had been prepared to go. The friendly giant went on its way. Friendliness is not traditionally associated with sharks, particularly those that hunt fish or kill seals. But as more is learned about sharks, how they detect their prey and which ones are more aggressive, swimming with them and filming them close up is no longer unusual. Howard has become as much a fellow traveler with them as the small fish that hitch a ride close to the snout of a Caribbean reef shark. These fish, that will pick up food scraps, are riding the pressure wave ahead of the shark, just as Howard was in front of the whale shark. Many kinds of fish, including the remoras, travel close to a large shark. Howard, in scuba diving gear, becomes just another underwater creature swimming alongside them. Howard is always looking for new methods and new equipment to improve his work. Most of our work underwater is done with scuba equipment, but scuba gear produces a huge amount of bubbles, and bubbles make lots of noise. A column of bubbles rising to the surface makes a noise like thunder and can be heard by animals probably more than a mile away. Filming with scuba gear is like filming on the Serengeti with a helicopter hovering overhead. Anything that's within a mile away is going to run like heck. Some animals, like hammerhead sharks, are afraid of the sound and are difficult to approach when using scuba equipment. In order to film hammerhead sharks, I realized we needed to find a better way. The better way meant using apparatus known as a rebreather. Developed for military use, it doesn't release noisy bubbles. The air is chemically treated and can be rebreathed many times. But the technique is dangerous. Any mistake balancing the chemistry of a rebreather can be fatal. We went through extensive training to use the rebreathers. In many ways, it was like learning to dive all over again. Then we came here to the Sea of Cortez, and for the first time ever, we were able to get inside the schools of hammerhead sharks.
Looking up at a school of hundreds of hammerhead sharks hovering overhead was one of the most magical moments I'd ever had underwater. And a little scary, not so much because of the sharks, but because the rebreathers were so novel they could kill us at any time. We realized there was things going on that we hadn't expected, and we captured, for the first time, a scene of hammerhead sharks mating, something that had never been seen before and certainly had never been filmed. I didn't do a very good job with this shot, but because it's the only one that exists, I was happy with it. Success with filming hammerheads set Howard and the team thinking about how to employ the re-breathing technique elsewhere. They chose to film a colony of garden eels, fish that hide in the sand from predators. Once again, the divers could approach silently and remain in the midst of the colony without the usual cacophony of air bubbles that can frighten the strange fish back into the sand. And again, a magical sequence was achieved of garden eels feeding on a blizzard of plankton. Using rebreathers may be risky, but Howard calculates it's a risk worth taking. A coral reef in the Gulf of Mexico. Howard and team member Bob Cranston will use their rebreathers for several hours between sunset and 11 at night. They are filming the spawning of the corals. On this one night in the year, the living coral polyps that cover the limestone mass of the reef liberate eggs and sperm into the sea. After only two hours, it will all be over. The divers have to be there on time and be fully prepared to stay and film this upside-down snowstorm. It's a brief and spectacular phenomenon. New equipment, like the rebreathers, allows new camera angles to be used such as looking straight up into a shoal of squid without bubbles in the way. And long periods spent underwater can result in first-time encounters. These pelagic stingrays use their wings to capture the squid and move them to their mouth. This was something I'd never seen before. Pelagic stingrays aren't very common, and to see them doing this was real surprise. The squid come here to mate, and they gather in huge numbers. The pelagic stingrays take advantage of the situation. The males each grab a female and secure a packet of sperm under her mantle. Then she'll be released to add her 25 centimeter case of fertilized eggs to the standing crop on the seabed. generation of squid is sacrificing itself in an orgy of reproduction. The males relentlessly pursue even those females that have already deposited a case of eggs. 
After the squid have mated and the females have laid their eggs, all the males and females die, leaving a carpet of eggs covering the bottom, and thousands upon thousands of tiny corpses. It seems sort of sad to see this happen, but it's part of the natural way and something you learn to accept. On the coral reef, some fish are sleeping, while others are hunters in the night. These reef sharks are sensitive to the twitches of a muscle or the pulsing of blood in the body of a sleeping victim. The sharks are hunting in a pack. If one of them pulls a sleeper from its bed, the rest will quickly join the frenzy, trying to claim a part of the kill. The hunting drama of the African plains finds its match on the coral reef. The sea is full of predators, but probably the most impressive predator is not a shark, but a squid. This is a Humboldt squid. It's huge, it's big as a man, weighs more than 100 pounds, and it's solid as a rock. Its tentacles are coated with sucker discs, and each sucker disc is lined with hook-like needles. At the center of the tentacles is a beak the size of an eagle's. It's an aggressive predator. It fears nothing. And it'll attack fish, and it'll even attack humans. The Humboldt squid is a nightmare in the dark. And while this is not the largest squid in the world's deep oceans, the stare of its large eye, the biggest in the invertebrate world, and its flashes of color in the diver's lights seem to warn that this is not a beast to be messed with. The vast majority of animals in the sea are not large at all. They're quite the reverse, very small, even microscopic, and special techniques are needed to film them at night. They drift, almost invisible, past anemones and corals that pluck them from the current and push them into their mouths. The drifting plankton is the grass of the sea the stuff on which the mighty whale sharks graze. Among the plankton are the larvae and young of many marine creatures, corals, anemones, fish, starfish, snails and crustaceans, though in forms hardly recognizable as the adult animals they'll become. Planktonic animals are very active at night. They rise closer to the surface, and they're busy feeding on microscopic algae and on each other. The larval forms are growing and slowly transforming into the worms, sea urchins, and other creatures from this ocean nursery. Most of these animals have no light of their own, but reflect that from the lamps which Howard takes into the sea. 
Sometimes my movie lights will attract a cloud of plankton, and that cloud of plankton will sometimes attract something larger, like this beautiful winged creature that glided in front of my camera for almost an hour. The cavernous maw of a manta ray scoops in water and filters out the mass of tiny animals caught on its gills. Flaps on the manta's head direct the flow into its mouth. Only water emerges through the gill slits. A manta feeds only on plankton and is cashing in on a photo opportunity. The night shooting is over, but there are other stories involving the manta that Howard can film in daylight. Attached to the back of the manta is a remora, a fish that gains a free ride and safety close to the larger animal. But there are other fish here that are of practical value to the manta. They are known as cleaners and service the huge ray, nibbling algae and parasites from the manta's extremities. Cleaners don't always have to be fish. Occasionally, they can be divers. My partner Bob Cranston swims up to a manta ray and tries his hand at the service. The manta ray loves it. It flicks a trailing edge of its wings if an indication that it's enjoying the service. If the manta ray was slightly bothered, one flick of its wings and it would be 100 yards away. Eventually, when it's had enough, it just glides away. The manta now seems in a mood to seek its true cleaner fish at a regular cleaning station on the reef. The hovering silhouette is a signal to certain fish at this location that the next customer has arrived. Just as antelopes will come to quench thirst at a waterhole on land, so all kinds of ocean fish rendezvous frequently here to have their bodies cleaned by other fish, whose mouths are shaped for nibbling. Tiny barber fish are picking dead scales and parasites from some Cortez chub that have come alongside for an appointment. And they also have much larger clients. Excitement spreads as the barbers react to the circling hammerhead shark. We call these places cleaning stations, and hammerheads gather here to be serviced by the barberfish. As they pass through the cleaning station, barberfish gather all around the shark, plucking parasites off their skin and sometimes directly off their teeth. Using our rebreathers allowed us to be inconspicuous. We cowered in the rocks as these animals came by and the barberfish gathered. It was terrific to be able to be down there and unnoticed by these spectacular predators. In a crowded ocean, many lives connect, and Howard Hall spends many hours watching for the subtleties of those interactions. The Caribbean reef sharks on the lookout for a meal are seldom alone. The other fish with them are not cleaners, just opportunist hangers-on, 
ready to catch the crumbs from the hunter's table. They are perhaps more like jackals hanging round a pride of lions. The delicate balance in those partnerships involving personal hygiene is much more of an evolutionary marvel. How did Pedersen shrimps come to be so trusting of a Nassau grouper that not only are they prepared to groom the outside of the fish, but they're willing to clean its lips or even pick its teeth? When did the fish first signal to such shrimps that no harm will befall them? Seemingly mesmerized by the busy shrimps, generations of groupers have patiently responded to every touch on mouth or gills. Millions of years ago, the lives of fish and shrimp converged. The healthy survival of both animals now hangs on this unbroken contract. Throughout the world's oceans, Howard Hall searches for such intriguing stories to film. His own relationship with the creatures in the sea echoes those between the animals themselves. He goes to where the animals prefer to be. And in the case of spotted dolphins, he knows what they seem to like and can attract their interest to him and his camera. We've long known that dolphins are attracted to propeller noise, so we decided to use sea scooters to see if we could attract the dolphins. I mounted my movie camera on one of the scooters and Bob took the other one. And it worked. Dolphins immediately showed up. They love the sound of a propeller. I haven't any idea why, but it's something they're fascinated by. Our idea was to use the scooters to attract the dolphins, and then, once they'd been around for a bit, we'd turn the scooters off and then I'd film some natural behavior. Unfortunately, every time I turned the scooter off, the dolphins would punish us by leaving. So, the whole thing turned into a sort of a game. Us riding the scooters, making a lot of noise, and the dolphins enjoying it and playing with us. We continued to roll the scooters even when we were long out of film. It was just a whole heck of a lot of fun. If I'd been born 200 years ago, I might have spent my life exploring Africa or even North America. But many of the places that were once wildernesses have all been explored. In the ocean is one of the few places you can go and still be where no man has been before and still see things that nobody's seen before. There are still animals down there that are yet to be discovered and there's behaviors nobody's witnessed. I sometimes worry that what I'm doing with my camera is capturing an archive of images of things that are no longer gonna exist 10, 15, or 20 years from now. I worry that may be true. And if it is, I'm gonna to try to continue doing it as long as I can in the best way I can. Hopefully, these animals will be around for a long time. But if they're not, I hope these images will serve to show people what we once had. One of Howard Hall's strangest encounters was with these giant jellyfish. 
Neither he nor the scientists he's shown this film to had ever seen them before. They drifted on a Pacific current like galleons on an ocean breeze. Aboard each was a complement of crabs, a strange crew aboard a strange vessel. They seemed to come from nowhere, and so far they've not been seen again. Howard Hall has given us the evidence that they did exist. <laughs> 